All right, tonight I'm going to be teaching you about the power of prayer. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1, please. Please turn over there. And then I want you to watch my other YouTube video, The Power to Get Your Prayers Answered. That's the title of the video, something like that. Power to Get Your Prayer Answered. In that video, I give you a lot of tips on how to get your prayers answered powerfully. So I'm not going to go through all those things in this video. But in this video, what I'm going to do is give you a more intimate connection with self and prayer. So this is very important. You define prayer. And prayer defines you. This is so important to understand. Your very existence should be because of prayer. What do I mean by that? Prayer should be so close in your life that we mistake it as a part of you. So your middle name should be prayer, actually. That's basically what I'm driving at. If your name is Gene Kim, and here's something that you've got to understand. When we think about you, who do we identify mostly with you most of the time? It's flesh. This is the number one hindrance to the power of prayer, is yourself. Self is the greatest enemy that hinders the power and the effect of prayer. Now think about this. If we were to mention Gene Kim, or any individual in this room, Max, Robert, Sean, Tom, Danielle, etc., etc., if we were going to mention these people's names, you got to think about this. What do people identify you as? The things of your flesh? Here's another thing concerning about which is so sad. People tend to remember just one flaw that you did more than your good. <laughs> That's a sad thing about human nature. But let me tell you one more, uh, one more bigger thing. The one who makes a big deal out of sin more than people is God. Well, that's something to think about. Had it not been the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, God would not forgive or forget. Well, that's something to think about. Okay, so what identifies as you? Is it flesh or is it prayer? Is it prayer? Read all the prayer warriors of today. There are famous books that are sold out. In fact, it doesn't matter what denomination they are or wrong doctrine they are. These authors and preachers are widespread uh, that people hear. Bible believers in any different denomination and Christian listen to these people. Because there's one thing in common that nearly every denomination agrees in, and that's the power of prayer. So E.M. Bounds' book on prayer, I bought a thick book that covers several books. Not just his book on prayer, but a thick one that covers a lot of his books. But if you just read one page out of that book, you can tell this guy, his language, his very communication and language is prayer. It made more sense when I conversed with Chuck more and more and more. If some of you met Chuck, you, the way that he talks is not like a normal person, so to speak. The way that he talks, you can tell he spent time in prayer. That's the way he talks. And the people who would know that are the people who know Chuck like I do. This brother would pray two to five hours a day, but the way he prayed was it's not a set routine of prayer. Sometimes there's a set routine in prayer. In prayer, it can be done by routine, which is important. But more important than that, it's daily living. Your pastor prioritizes prayer more on this one than on this one. Your pastor prioritizes more on this one than this one. Some of you might know that if I mentioned to you about a spe specific task to do, I would mention while you're doing it, make sure you pray. Make sure you pray and do this. And some of you told me you've seen the difference, right? You see, that's what the power of prayer is, is that it's got to be a part of your daily living. Before I speak on the pulpit, I pray. Before I speak to someone, instead of getting into the flesh, if I'm arguing with someone, you know what I do? I pray. Before I give an answer, 
I actually tell myself, God, I cannot answer this question. They bring up a good argument. I can use my own fleshy wisdom, but I do know this, Lord. When I use my own fleshy wisdom, I always mess up, and you taught me that. So, Lord, please give me an answer. Now, do you Christians do that, or do you get in the flesh and you just argue from the Bible knowledge you know? This is why prayer is more important than Bible knowledge. Mm -mm -mm. Now, look at Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1. This is a powerful verse. Then said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. Now, did you read this passage carefully? This is very important. God said that Moses and Samuel right here, they prayed in, in the stead of Israel. That's why Israel did not see God's judgment yet. See that? Israel did not experience God's judgment yet because there were two people who stood before the Lord and prayed for Israel. Here's another thing. Did you notice right here that the verse says that God's mind could not be changed at Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 1 at this particular passage? That means that Moses and Samuel had the power to change God's mind before. Do you know how powerful this is? This is very powerful. Because what you got to understand is the power of prayer can change the mind of an infinite, awesome, powerful God. One of the easiest examples is probably the date settings concerning about the rapture and the coming of the Antichrist. When you read the Bible, we're, uh, I'm not going to get real deep here, but there's a doctrine we believe called the postponement theory. In other words, the Jews could have, when they received their Messiah, they could have had their rapture, and the Roman Caesar could have been the Antichrist. That's the reason why Roman power had to shift 2,000, lead, uh, 2000 years later to Catholic, see? Because God, in his word, had to retain a Roman element here. But aside from that, see, the Lord could have done that. But what? The Lord changed his mind concerning that. Why? It depended upon the free will of the people there. So you got to realize this, is that a lot of times when you pray for a soul to get saved, that's perhaps the reason why the Lord, out of his great love and mercy, did not take that loved one home yet or start the tribulation yet to be deceived by the Antichrist. Because, I don't know if you read 2 Peter 3, 9, that's a powerful passage. That verse is proof why the Lord delayed his coming. It's because he wants everyone to get saved. You know why? Because you're still there praying for your loved one's soul. That's the power of prayer. So it can change the mind of God. What was it about these two people that you noticed that changed God's mind? What you got to understand is that Samuel, he said at the book of Samuel, that God forbid that he should sin when he does not pray for his people. That's what he says. So every minister and leader should be praying for their people. If they don't, then they sin. That'll preach. Before you preach on the pulpit, do you pray for the people? Conviction? Moses, what did he do? He, uh, he was slow of speech and slow of tongue. Remember that? Exodus chapter 3. But you know, that slow of speech and slow of tongue, for some weird reason, was anointed with God's power that that tongue could pray powerfully and change God's mind. An example, Numbers chapter 14, I believe. God said, I'm going to kill all these people and give you the whole promised land. Now, if I was Moses, I would say, good riddance, praise the Lord. No, uh, no, that'd be a horrible thing, obviously, that your pastor would do that. But usually that's flesh, right? That's flesh. Moses, what did he do? Oh, no, Lord. No, Lord, think about your glory, your name. He changed God's mind. There's something about these two people, and when you read their life, there is one thing that's undeniable. They had a relationship with prayer. I'm not saying that they prayed people. I am said they had a relationship with prayer. Their very existence is prayer itself. 
When some people, now this might bring some conviction to some of you, especially to people in my church, but I hope that um, th I have to say this, that way you don't miss out a blessing, okay? If you're afraid to pray in this church, I have to say this, it shows what your relationship with God is like. You, why do you say that, Pastor? Because if you have a strong relationship with God, then naturally prayer should come out of your mouth. Not like, is there a right way to pray? I don't think I can pray right in this church. I'm going to say the wrong words. That will bring conviction. Now, we don't bash people here. You know, We don't want to embarrass people. We want everyone to feel comfortable and welcome in our church. Amen? But I'm not going to rob you a blessing by not saying that to you. There is so much blessing. Here's another thing, friend. Your daily communication also can show what your life is in prayer. Mm. Okay, so here's the thing is that in your daily co communication, if you pray so much in your life, this changes your conversation, your speech. If prayer is your existence, you have a relationship, prayer is you, what happens is then the conversation that comes out of your mouth and your action manifest if you have a strong prayer life. If we don't see some fruit in your life, there's something wrong with you in your prayer life. You might say, why, Pastor? Because if prayer is a part of you, then a part of you should show prayer. That should be the case right there. Here's another thing. Another thing is this, is that if you have a weak prayer life, it also shows your, how much you know that Bible. You might say, what do you mean, Pastor? So one of the tips and prayers that I gave, now I gave a sermon on prayer. It's called Shake the Foundations. If you want to watch that video, that's fine. Shake the Foundations. But I gave a sermon on prayer on that one. But, oh, by the way, that sermon took me three months to prepare it. Because <laughs> it was a sermon on prayer that had a lot of time to think and to pray about. But aside from that, one thing I learned about some of these prayer warriors is this. They believed in reading the Bible first before they prayed. You might say, why is that? Because they themselves don't trust in their own flesh to pray. By reading the Bible, they look at the mind of God and what he wants, and what he prefers in prayer. And by doing that, then they can pray correctly. Here's another thing that I noticed with the power of prayer, which made more sense to me. It's faith and the will of God. That's two things I want you to put down here. Now, there's a danger with arrogance in saying, I know what the will of God is, and this is what it's going to be. And sometimes God teaches you a lesson in your pride and say, no, it's going to be a different will right here so that I can teach you to be humble. So there's a, there's a difference with arrogance. But here's something else. There are people, when you read these people, and I notice this sometimes out of Chuck's life as well, I notice. They believe that when they pray that, this will, that the Lord will answer this. Now, in God's prayer request, it's always yes, no, and maybe, or wait. So we can't really tell his mind. But here's something. When you spend so much time in that book, you know God's mind. You know more and more what he wants, what he prefers. That's why when they pray, they have more faith in what they pray in what will happen. That's one thing I noticed about that. What if I get arrogant and prideful? See, they grow so much in the mind of God, they know the limitation of what is arrogance and prideful, dictating on what God's will is. Man, how do I know that, Pastor? That's something I can't tell you. That is something you need to experience and do, and you know it. Sometimes you got to understand this. Sometimes scientists and people who do some kind of jobs and uh, technician work, it's something they can't explain to you. It's something that you do. Something you live and breathe in. 
that you, that you can handle it yourself. They can give you all the instructions they can on textbook, but trust me, even if you memorize everything in a textbook, it's totally different when you do it. Likewise, just because you know so much of that Bible, it's totally different when you do it. You can be Dr. Gene Kim and do all the doodles and know your dispensationalism backwards and forwards, win debates in apologetics and et cetera, et cetera. But if that's all you got and you don't do prayer, there's a total difference and you know very little. Is this putting you under conviction? So you know what you should be doing? Now, I'm not trying to discourage this, okay? But if you've been watching our videos more, listening to Final Fight Bible Radio more, listening to all these preachers more, and getting into all the current trends on the news on the Antichrist, Satan, and conspiracies, this shows a very bad thing. You're more infatuated with evil than with your time with God. That will mess up your mind. Now look, praise the Lord that our videos have helped you out and I'm not belittling other things that helped you in your spiritual walk, but you got to realize this is that you can know all of that in your head, but my friend, just knowing it all in the head is totally different than from the heart. The heart lives and breathes in prayer with God. If I were to look at your prayer time compared to you listening to flesh, what are the hours in comparison? Ooh, ooh. You know what Martin Luther once said? He said it was a sin if you prayed less than three hours a day. <laughs> to be honest, I, don't, I think that's too far. I can't even do that. But these people understood. The KJV translators, they can bash them for all they want. Oh, these people, they didn't know right doctrine like we did and blah, 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 blah. Didn't you know they were baby sprinklers so your KJV Bible should not be inspired? I wonder why God chose that KJV translator rather than you, you little punk you. You know why? Because you read the life story of these KJV translators, they woke up early in the morning. Despite of all that knowledge of Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and so many languages, these people woke up early in the morning and prayed. I don't know if this is true, but I heard one of the KJV translators <laughs> Lancelot Andrew, something like that. That's his name, I think. Pray 10 hours. Now, you repent and you get right with God. I, don't throw me your doctrine, okay? You repent and get right with God, just hearing that. Read all these prayer warriors. There is one thing I guarantee you. When you read the journals of all these prayer warriors, you're going to see this. You're going to see this common trend. And when you read their writings you can tell it breathes in prayer. Their language is prayer. Imagine God mentioned these two names. And guess what? He did not mention any other name in your Bible. He mentioned these two particular names concerning prayer. So think about it. I mean, what was it that these two people had that other people didn't have? You go home and you pray about it. And not only that, remember this, Moses was slow of speech and slow of tongue. I don't care how untalented you are in speech, you can pray. I don't care if you're a Samuel who reaches old age and the nation of Israel is in apostasy, you can pray. And Samuel, guess what? He had wicked boys too, didn't you know that? He had wicked boys. He, he's a poor example of a leader perhaps. But God nevertheless mentioned his name because there was something strong with his prayer life. Jesus Christ, do you know why he was the beloved son in whom God was well pleased? Because he prayed early in the morning at the mountain before he was so busy training his disciples, doing all the miracles, attacking all the world who was against him, you know, preaching against their sin. He prayed early in the morning. Another thing about Jesus Christ is, you know how he got victory over Satan in the wilderness? He was fasting as well. See, you can tell he had a prayer life there. Now, here's another thing. You heard of great men of God who produced powerful revivals and souls saved, right? They mentioned a key thing, the filling power of the Spirit, right? But do you know how you get the filling power of the Spirit? You pray. 
Praying Hyde, the name Hyde became dubbed with Praying Hyde because he was famously known for prayer, prayer, prayer. Famous preachers like uh, Wilbur Chapman asked Hyde to pray for him for a church meeting. That's how much he depended on him. Got the prayer answer. Hudson Taylor, I mean, excuse me, George Mueller never even asked a dime for his orphanages. And while Hudson Taylor was struggling with no money, George Mueller was the one who prayed in the money and gave the money to Hudson Taylor at China. I can go on and on and on, but listen to these people. So there are famous books and sermons out there if you're interested. E.M. Bounds is the most famous one. E.M. Bounds on prayer. Read George Mueller's life. You can tell that he had power in prayer. David Brainerd, uh, some things you got to be cautious because he's Calvinist. But if you read his diary, he had power in prayer. He would pray in the middle of the winter, storm, uh, the winter snow that the snow would even melt around him. That's like Jesus praying so hard that he sweated as if it were great drops of blood. David Brainerd prayed so hard one time that in the middle of an Indian pagan festival, as soon as he walked, these Native Americans knew there was something different about him, and they stopped. That's the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Uh, Leonard Ravenhill, he's got a lot of sermons audio and online, but he's got a lot of good sermons on prayer too, that if you just listen to it, you can tell he breathes in prayer as well. So the... George Mueller, read, his, uh, read all of his writings, his journal. You could tell there's power in prayer through that as well. Study his life as well, and you can tell. If you're that curious, I would also recommend to look up the KJV translators. It's not just one, but read all their uh, lives, and then see their schedule, their routine. There's some prayer routine they've got. It's no wonder... They knew so, that the Lord trusted them to translate his word. Maybe because they knew, they knew the word that much. They didn't know doctrine like we do. You know why? Because we're spoiled rotten. We were trained by so many Bible-believing preachers, teachers before us. And these KJV translators, they had a relationship with God. 